All right, what is up everybody? This is Alex with another EOT Newsflash Extra. This is the uh, Deck Tech and Tournament Report that I promised you guys from this week's episode from the Star City Games Super IQ that I played on on August 20th, so a week ago if you're watching this in real time. Um, I decided to take the Jeskai Nahiri control list that's been doing really well as of late in the modern metagame. Um, as soon as Nahiri got printed back in Shadows of our Innistrad, people were trying to figure out what this card actually does, and the most obvious answer in modern is it goes against Emrakul. Um, so guys like Jim Davis and Pete Ingram have been doing really well with the deck, and I finally decided to finish up the deck myself and basically just take it for a spin and see what this deck was actually capable of doing. Um, so we're going to start out with just the deck tech and then go into the, the round by round that I played in. Um, obviously I, I took 8th place, so that was pretty sweet, so spoilers there. Um, <laughs> so that, let's just, let's, we're just going to break it down. The, the, the main 60 isn't all that different from anybody else's list. There's a couple of cards in here of note that I do want to talk about though before moving to the cyber where things get a little bit more interesting I think. And then we'll actually get to the, the rounds themselves. So. The creature package is as, as it stands. Four Snapcasters, one Emrakul, one Villain Dillian Click. Um, I've seen versions of like two clicks, no clicks. It's kind of a, it's whatever you, your metagame works best with. Click is really good against combo decks. Um, Snapcaster is just the best creature ever printed in modern. And Emrakul, well, it's it's Emrakul. Uh, Four Nahiri the Harbinger, um, despite being a four of, she's so, so versatile. And she's made a really big impact on the modern metagame at large. And just that she that she represents a planeswalker that as soon as it comes down, it makes the game all about her. So you play it, you play the Nahiri, and all of a sudden your opponent has to shift all their attention to her, just in case she does get to that ultimate, which happens so quickly. You play a Nahiri, and you basically say, "I just put Emrakul on suspend two. You've got to do something about this now." So she's super powerful and super versatile. I love everything that she does. Um, I've seen some versions that actually play a Tamio. Um, the original original Tamiyo. Um, I've seen versions that are playing a Johnny Vengeance in the main board. I've, there's a lot of you know customization that you can put into this deck, I think. Um, but as it stands, I've I really liked the 60 that's been kind of doing um, the best as of late for a lot of other players. Um, going to the spell slots, you know the bolts, the helixes, the leaks, the paths, everything is the same. Um, and Social Vision is a huge card for this deck. Um, some other you know blue based control decks I've been playing in the past have wanted more like Thought Scour effects, which are great if you want to have a card um, a card um, quality, I should say. Um, so like the Grixis control decks I've been, I was playing for a while wanted to have Thought Scours, Serum Visions, and Ancestral Visions um, because they just want to have just a, a constant selection of cards. This deck more wants card quantity. Um, so the Ancestral Visions are really, really helpful in digging you out of, you know, just kind of like this board states. If you set it on one, if you get to go on turn one and just put it down, it's going to set you up that much better to play the later games. And all of your spells are so high impact, you know. all Every time that you draw a new spell, it's going to have some kind of application, whether you're trying to go on, trying to burn your opponent out, or pick, pick up a creature, or it's a Nahiri, or it's one of your other creatures, which are all just super versatile. Um, so this this card is just absolutely absurd, and the part of the reason I, I play this deck now is because when I was playing Jund, um, this de this card's Ancestral Vision was just wrecking me every single time. If they, if they got it to go off, the cards they would draw would just put me so far behind just by having Inquisitions and Thought Seizes and Lilianas. This this is the real deal. I don't know if four is the right number. If three is the right number, it might be four or two. But for the most part, I've seen three just being kind of the de facto number to go to. Love it. Um, Serum Visions, as always, a great all-star. Um, the one card that I've seen some people not quite sure on is like that 27th spell slot in their deck. Um, I, I've gone with um, Supreme Verdict, I've gone with Anger of the Gods, and now I'm on the Time of the Reinforcements plan. This card is probably your best turn three against a deck that if you have a, a turn to really kind of just, if you've countered a spell or you burn out a creature on their end step and you untap a three mana, and the boards kind of stabilize. This is a great spell to fire off if you've got, especially if you have the life loss um, effect in place and also the creatures. Like, you want to get both sides of the card to get absolute value out of this card. This card is absolutely nuts. And if you can get both sides off, you're in great shape to just pass the turn and then probably on your next turn, cast in a Hiri and start going after the ultimate. So, uh, like I said, this card is, I'm not sure if this is the right card for the, for the, for the 70, for the 60 main board. Um, Maybe it's something different. Maybe it does need to be explosive um, and um, anger the gods or supreme verdict. I'm not sure. I'm gonna keep trying it out. 
All right, so over to the mana base, it's all pretty much stock. Not a whole lot of different things going on here. Um, usually when I play these blue control decks, blue-white control decks, I should say, they do have four Celestial Colonnades. This one just doesn't because it can't afford that many tapped lands. Um, I can see some, you know, some people playing four, four if they want to have 24 lands. It's, it's really up to you and how you want to customize this deck, but as just for a stock list, I wanted to go with what had been working for everybody else, then make my gun customizations later on. Um, the one card that I did want to change from the list that I have been seeing is the Ghost Quarter, which I replaced with the Desolate Lighthouse. Um, depending on your metagame, the Ghost Quarter makes absolute sense. If Tron is big in your metagame, if you've got a lot of Jun decks that are you know, using the Raid Reader Beans to beat you down, I can totally get the, you wanting to play a Ghost Quarter. And, that's, and that makes perfect sense. Um, the Desolate Lighthouse is just a pet card of mine. Just the ability to start drawing cards very, very quickly. Filtering out your hand with the, any lands you might draw or redundant spells. Or heck, if you get rid of the Emrakul to shuffle it back in, it's just another way to get Emrakul out of your hand in addition to the Nahiri's. So I could go either way on it. Sometimes I might need this to be a Ghost Quarter, like I said, or a Tectonic Edge. Um, it just really depends on your meta game. So get a feel for your meta first and then pick this slot. So onto the sideboard where things are really exciting. Um, I got made fun of during the, the, the first run of the top eight um, by uh, Judge Jim, if you guys know him from the DW area, because my sideboard is basically all one-ofs. <laughs> um, I've never really built a sideboard in my life that had any more, um, that had any more than like two or three copies of a card in the sideboard. Everything else is just one-ofs. I can't, I, 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 it's a sideboard. There's 15 cards you get to play with. Let me have extra spells. I don't want to be stuck in on playing like four, 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 and four. I, I don't want to do that. So we're running down real quick for you guys. Engine explosives, Great against uh, Affinity, uh, against uh, Lantern Control, any deck that has a solid number of their permanents sitting on a certain converted mana cost. Merfolk, Affinity, like I mentioned, it's even good against Infect in some cases. Um, some Zoo decks, it just like, completely folds to. So super sweet, super sweet card. Uh, Relic of Progenitus, this card is a it's a, it's, a, it's a necessary evil against the other blue control decks that fight with Snapcaster Mages, the Dredge decks that are popping up now. Um, some Jun decks you can really blow them out with this if they're like on that Delirium Plants and popping up recently. Really, really versatile card. Always go with this one unless you've got, you know, unless there's a more oppressive presence of Jund or graveyard based decks in your metagame. I can see this easily being um, a Rest in Peace or um, maybe even Leyline of the Void if you're in a black based control deck. Uh, next one I've got is, is that Static Caster, one of my favorite cards ever printed. The Menace of Affinity and Infect and other small, you know, swarm-based decks in the, in the meta. I love having this guy in my sideboard, and he always comes in for, in a lot of games. Absolutely love it. Uh, Stony Silence is just the ace in the hole against Affinity. If, unless they have a wear and tear effect, or they can thought these out of your hand, which did happen in the tournament. Um, this is this is a KO against them. It's a, it's a great one to have in your sideboard right now, I think. Especially with the presence of Dredge being such a threat in the metagame, it's really letting Affinity kind of stretch its legs again. So being able to combat it in, in a very just specific way and shut down their entire deck, specifically the, their mana and, well, basically their entire deck for that matter, um, it's a great, great card to have. Uh, next we have a Celestial Purge. This is one that I'm not quite sold on just yet, but I do like having it. Um, just because it answers a wide variety of threats right now, it can hit Liliana's, opposing Nahiri's. It hits Karanos against some of the, the Blue Moon decks. It hits Blood Moon. Um, just a really solid card because a lot of the problem permanents you might be dealing with as a blue base control deck right now are typically black or red. Liliana being the probably the number one threat, I would say, against decks like this, even though we do have Ancestral Vision now. Um, Dispel, it's Dispel. Uh, Tuna Gates, great for, you know, the Control Mirrors, Burn, um, any combo deck that wants to go off with non-creature spells, always great to have. Uh, wear and Tear, I love having Wear and Tear, I love having um, multi-purpose cards, you know, multi-function cards in my 75s at all times. I always love having Cryptic Command, but just, it's not really playable right now, I don't think. So having this as a great answer to fight against artifacts and enchantments of all shapes and sizes this is a great card to have. I ne Unless, you know, I've got a really good read on the metagame, I'll usually keep one of these in my sideboard. Now we come to the, one of the new additions. Um, so Gideon Ally of Zendikar was originally Elspeth's son's champion, which I had played previous to playing this deck and other Jeskai control builds I had done. And in my, in my testing, nothing could beat son's champion. Um, 
it's it's just so hard to answer and the board presence it generates so quickly is absolutely insurmountable in modern if the game goes long there's no better threat than that other than maybe like karn but you know we're not really it's it's a different kind of deck altogether that we're, that we're playing here um getting just easier to cast plain and simple and it does essentially the same thing and eventually turns into a win con itself um with its plus one you can start beating in um, and making, you know, if you've got like Tyler Reforcer's tokens in play and you can pop the emblem, that's not a, a small thing to overcome. Um, but just making two twos every single turn um, is a great thing to do, especially against mid range decks like Jund or Obzon. Even the Mirror, I can see this card coming in and just being another dimension of attack that your opponent now has to deal with. Super excited. I, I didn't get to board it in at all during the tournament. I haven't got to board it in at all since I started playing in the sideboard. But. That might just be because I'm not playing the right decks, and it might be time for Gideon to leave the sideboard. You know, here I got to actually see play, but we're going to keep testing him because he's, he's super sweet. Uh, next we have Anger of the Gods. Um, this is great against all of the Zoo decks, against Dredge decks if they don't have their Greater Gargan on in play, against Affinity, um, Merfolk in some cases. Just a really solid sweeper. I've seen some people move towards Kozlik's Return. I'm not sure if that fits better in the Jund decks that have been playing it. Or if there's a place for it in just kind of control, I'm not sure yet. But for a deck that wants to operate mostly at instant speed, I can see the argument for it. Um, so that, that might be swapped in at some point just for, to test it out. Uh, next we have Crumble the Dust. Uh, Tron is probably one of the worst matchups for us. Any control player in Modern knows that Tron is absolutely atrocious. And getting to play Crumble the Dust is absolutely huge to shut down one of their Tron pieces completely. And if you can flashback a Snapcaster Mage, it's even better. Um, not so relevant against other decks if you play a lot against a lot of Infect and you can slow the game down to your pace of play instead of their hyper-aggressive, you know, attack plan. Getting to fire this off against their Ink Bomb Nexus is, isn't a terrible plan. Uh, I don't know if it's fast enough for, for you if you're going to be playing a deck like this. Uh, the next one we have is Supreme Verdict. Um, it's just another Wrath Effect. This card, you know, it just does it all in, in this case. Um, Mid-range decks, merfolk decks, creature decks in general. Blow stuff up and you're good to go. Um, then we have Timely Reinforcements as the, uh, one of our last cards here in our sideboard. Um, just another copy of having this in the sideboard is great against all the aggressive decks in the meta right now. Against Zoo, against Affinity, against Burn. I absolutely love this card. And I'm actually, let's see, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14! So we're missing a card from my sideboard, which is actually really unfortunate. Um, because it's one of the cards that I was most excited to play at the tournament, and that is Blessed Alliance. Brand new card from Eldrick Moon. Has the Escalade mechanic on there. Um, originally, the slot was held by Geist of St. Trapped, which I never brought in and could ever figure out what I wanted to do with it. I just had a 15 slot to, to kind of work with. So, basically, this card comes in against Bogles, it comes against Infect, it comes in against Affinity in some cases against Burn with the with the life gain part of the part of the card, but just the, the sacrifice, it's the, it's the Celestial Flare mode that I'm absolutely in love with. Um, I used to play a lot of Celestial Flare when I was playing when it was legal and standard, and this card is just the next best thing to it. It's it's an awesome card, and I'm kind of bummed it's not on my sideboard here, but uh, it was there. I did play it. I absolutely did play it. So, that's the 75. Um, if you've got experience with this deck, you know how versatile it is and how just flexible you can be with all of your card choices. I still think that even with the rise of Dredge and the, the relative speed of the format, which definitely has been on the uptick, I still think this is one of the best decks in the format to play right now. Um, if you like the deck, let me know. If you have any suggestions that I can make to the sideboard, let me know as well. We can maybe you know figure out some new tech for it. Um, like our good friend Gideon right here. I'm, I'm convinced this guy's good for modern. Convinced. So, on to the actual tournament report. So, round one, Murpho, my good buddy Paul, who the last time we played was at a set event for a SCG Open. Um, at the time I was playing Splinter Twin, and he mentioned that as we sat down. I said, yeah, and you know what else happened in that match? We drew, because you wouldn't concede to me, and I wouldn't concede to him either. Um, got him into... Both games, my my deck just basically did what it wanted to. Just drew all of the counter, all of the all of the removal spells. The counter magic is really ineffective against him because of his Cavern of Souls and his Aether Vials, which are a problem for the deck to fight against. Um, just makes things really difficult to actually use counter magic effectively. Um, so all the removal spells were really good. I got to I got to ultimate um, with Nahiri both games and finished the game off. Open and shut case. Um, the next one I, match I had was actually one I did not expect to win, and that was Living End. Um, as he sat down, he mentioned that he got the buy round one, and he never actually played the deck in a tournament, so I'm already thinking, 
this is going to be weird. And I mentioned that um, a bunch of all my friends were playing Jund that today at the tournament, which there was about five or six people playing Jund at this tournament. And he mentioned, oh, I have a great matchup against Jund. And I started trying to cycle through my head, what is he talking about? And I just mentioned Living End. He got this big old smile on his face, and I knew I was in trouble because Living End is not a deck that you want to show up with Nahiri um, with. So basically the, the issue comes is that if I ever go for the ultimate and get Emrakul in play, he can just cast into Living End and make a gear of Emrakul immediately. Not what I want to have happen. So it, I left it in the deck both games just to see it, just, it, just in case. But basically what ended up happening is that game one, it was just a Snapcaster Bolt Fest. That's all it was. And that was great. Got him down very quickly. Um, he gave me a beast token off a of beast, and then we blew up on my lands, but I managed to draw out of it. Snap catch some bolts, it's still amazing. Um, game two, I knew I was in a little bit more of a rough spot because one of the key cards that they bring against these against blue decks nowadays is Ricochet Trap, which is a three and a red instant that's able to redirect a spell or redirect the target of a spell, but has a alternate casting cost of one red, um, being the trap mechanic from um, from Zendikar block, where you can pay a red mana, a single red mana, if an opponent casts a blue spell that turn. So it gets a little dangerous when you're when you're playing with uh, playing against them, because when you do bring in your gates and your dispels to try and stop their cascade abilities, you're kind of potentially walking into a ricochet trap that they can cast for literally nothing. Um, fortunately, it was just another snap bolt fest. Just I was super relieved to win this match because. I know how difficult it is, even for just regular blue control decks. There's such a hard time beating decks like this that just have an instant speed combo to just pull all their control out of their graveyard. Super stoked to win that match. Was happy to be moving on undefeated at that point. So then we moved on to the the the, the matchup that I was the most worried about, to be honest, that I, on my radar at least to be, to be worried about. And that was Affinity. Um, Got him in game one, he gets me in game two. I managed to wipe the board, stabilize it two, and he found Edge Champion. It happens. Um, round three, I got to land the uh, game two, actually. He, he had the turn one Thought Seize and got the Stony Silence out of my hand, and I just knew it was going to be a Pabal from there. Game three, he mulligans to six, and I was already feeling good. You know, Affinity is a deck that does mulligan quite often, but it can, mulligan, it can get out of its own mulligans because the cards are so powerful. If there's, you know, a good six is always be better than a decent seven in that deck just because of how that deck actually functions. I got the Sony Silence on him though on turn two, so that felt great. Um, basically, just got to whittle him down and eventually find the Emmerich Cool and just, you know, go from there. He, I did get to show off a busted alliance against a Edge Champion in that game. Finally, um, he was attempting to kill the Nahiri that I had played just to keep it under control. And the whole room was kind of watching the game, and everyone was like, "Did he actually just cast a Blessed Alliance? Like that's a that's a standard card, Alex. What are you doing?" And I just kind of smiled and went along with it. Um, round four was a draw. Uh, I don't actually remember what he was playing. I think he was on either Zoo or Burn. Um, but at that point, I I knew knowing that we only five rounds, that an X um, going X you know X O X X and one having at least one draw was gonna be fine. So I knew if I just had to play the next round, I'd be fine to go for top eight, and that would be that. Um, so game five is where um, I finally felt like I was outclassed by a deck, and this guy was on Mardu um, Gorio's Vengeance, and it was a very interesting build. Typically, the Grix the Gorio Vengeance decks I've played against most recently have been either red black or Grixis colored. And he decided to bring white to the, to the game because he was able to play Nahiri and Lingering Souls. And he also had a brand new component of his deck in Insolent Neonate, which is typically a dredge card. And that's what I thought he was on. I was watching him play in an earlier match. And then I saw the Nahiri and realized what he was doing. So basically, um, these, the Insolent Neonates were the worst, were the most annoying part of his deck. Because if I tried to kill them before his combat step, he could just as easily sacrifice it, discard a card, and draw a new card. And if he discarded Emrakul or Grizzlebrand, he could just Gorio's Vengeance it back and kill me like that. Um, it was a super weird matchup. Um, I got to finally interact with a Splice card. Um, he spliced a Gorio's Vengeance onto a Gorio's Vengeance. Turns out if you counter the first Gorio's Vengeance with the Spliced one on, it counters the whole thing. So that was great. Um, there was some confusion right there when he actually cast it. Um, but yeah, the Insolent Neonates were a huge problem. It just looked like it had been Menace and his ability to draw cards instantly. Uh, I lost this one and two. <laughs> just 
outclassed by a combination of hand disruption and his instant speed combo that could just go off whenever. And not having any counter magic because it got thought seized was kind of a bummer. So took the first loss there. That was okay though. Locked the top eight going three, one, and one. Was ready to go for a top eight and got to play against Paul again and his Merfolk deck. And this the time things were on his, uh, were much more on his, um, on his side of things. Um, game one just locked me out with a bunch of spreading seize effects. Could never get my feet out, my feet back underneath me to really amount certain, you know, amount some kind of defense or anything like that. Um, he got me there and in game two, things were really, really, really close until he drew back to back, dispel the spell and the gate negate for all my removal spells I was trying to take out his Lords with. Um, there was a turn that I missed an attack with the Celestial Colonnade simply because I wanted to have the ability to block after I pathed one of his lords to prevent the island walk and take out one of his mutavolts he was attacking with. But that was the turns he drew, the millions of, millions of counter spells. Um, so unfortunately he got me and, you know, ended my top eight run right there. Um, but that was okay. I, you know, it was my first major tournament with a, with a deck that I've been working on for a little bit that I was really excited to play. Super happy to make top eight, you know, got the cash, got the top eight um, pin, the play mat. Everything was great. I was loving it. Um, got to go up there with some friends of mine. I was up there with Will, um, Tanner's up there too. Like I said, Paul, everyone, I got all of my friends, lots of, lots of people I'd known from the area were up there. Great judge step up there. Um, we were at More Fun Game Center up in Denton, Texas, right off the square. If you've never been up there, I highly recommend that place. It's a great little shop to go play at. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that's my top eight story from last weekend. That's the seventy five. If you haven't got a chance to play this deck yet, test it out. You know, on X Mage or Cockatrice or whatever. Uh, this is a deck I really highly recommend going forward. It's got a lot of play to it at all times. The sideboard is super customizable to your meta. And I just, I absolutely love playing decks like this. I love Nahiri. She's probably now in my top 10 favorite cards of all time. Maybe I'll do that list at some point. I don't know. <laughs> um, but for now, um, I have I have a new project to work on. Um, and I hope the results will be smashing.